Okay, you're live. Good morning, everybody. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, again, welcome everybody to the March 29th, 2022 meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Um, first thing on our agenda are the minutes. Gentlemen, do you have any additions or corrections? I don't. Hearing none, I move we approve the minutes of proceedings of the Board of Commissioners of Montezuma County, March 22nd, 2022. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the proceedings of the Board of Commissioners of Montezuma County. Colorado, March 22nd, 2022. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and then we are gonna go straight into planning. John and Sherry Jane, come on down. Good morning. Good morning. So we have two items. One's just signing a mylar for Camp Cush. Uh, and, the, um, and the high impact permit that's been previously approved. Okay. Um, then we also have, actually it's two uh, exemption amendments. Uh, Charles Shumway and Sarah Kimball. They have two well, one's a 15 acre parcel there on the south that was created by um, an exemption. And then they have a 14.46 acre parcel on the east that was also created by an exemption. And they would like to do a boundary line adjustment, thereby amending both of those exemptions. How do you get to the 20 acre parcel? The 15 on the south and the 15 on the east will become a, a 20 on the south and a no, 10. No, I meant access, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Across or down road 41.9. Okay, so they'll be able to so come cur in off yeah, of the cur road. Yeah, currently uh, the 15 acres on the south, those three lots were created by exemption. And actually the, the south lot has a leg that extends to the north and uh, accesses County Road. Okay, so the, so the County Road is gonna be the access for but, both of them now. But in the, the future, 10 the yeah, with, with this boundary line adjustment, they'll both border 41.9. It's a red signed road. Their house is on the, uh, the east property there, their current residence. Correct, up at the top? Correct. I see no problems. Any other questions, gentlemen? No. And so just, just to clarify on your motion, it's Charles Shumway and uh, Sarah Kimball. Okay, any other questions or discussion, gentlemen? None. None. I don't see any problems with it. It, it complies to everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I move to approve this amendment to exemption number P-56-80 and exemption number p 70-80 submitted by Charles Shumway and Sarah Kimball on property located at 12685 Road 41.9, Mancus, Colorado. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the amendment of exemption to P-56-80 and exemption P-70-80 <coughs> submitted by Charles Shumway and Sarah Kimball on property located at 12685 Road 41.9 makes Colorado. Any further discussion? No. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. And, just and we'll, we'll have to get those documents put together with with the information and get those signed okay. next week. All right. Snapped me. Okay. That's it for today? That's it. Gosh, two yeah. weeks in a row. That's right. Getting you ready for next week. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm that's what I'm worried about. We do, this with we do six have or eight one of them. one other item, um, but I guess I'll go ahead and mention we got a complaint um, from from one of the neighbors, a group of neighbors up uh, by road twenty four and T where the uh, fire was mm -hmm. a week ago. Um, they've identified or, or at least stated that there's several other concerns with both those properties. Um, the first one just east of 24 and then the second one east of that one. Um, so I sent an email back to the, uh, the complaining people and I copied um, just about everybody in else in the county and all the other departments to respond because they've got issues of unattended fires, putting a house on there without notifying us, um, no septic system application or, or design, a landfill of trash, burning trash. Um, they claim they've called the sheriff's department four times for unattended burns. The last one was the actual fire that was uh, in the paper a week ago, and Lewis Areola and uh, Dolores Fire District had to respond. So, I mean, obviously, this is another complaint that's going to come to us. What? Uh, so it sounds like they're out of compliance with several land use. Right. Land use, fire, solid waste. Um, so the, the first critical one what? is the fire. If the fire is out of control, they can be cited for that. Uh, well, and the, that should be the sheriff, right? Through the fire department, well. And they, the I, fire marshal would sheriff, yeah. On this last one, they weren't. I don't know what's happened in the previous three calls, but I copied Sheriff Nallen so that he can respond and see what and why if there's been four fires then they should have at least three tickets well I think before we we go to um, 
ticketing, I think we need to make it known for everybody that I know everybody's burning fields and they're doing their spring cleanup. Um, but there is a, they, they do need to call dispatch. They do need to let them know that they are burning. They do need, and then dispatch can notify the fire departments. Right. Um, so these are not reported are to not dispatch. dispatch. These, these were not notified and these were unattended. So they're serious issues as we can see because it got loose and caused the fire. If it gets over into that drainage, we got a real problem. <coughs> Sheriff Neat. That's something Sheriff Neat. So we'll, we'll uh, I guess then we'll, we'll talk to the Sheriff to see if, what the issue is, but how do we, how do we even, uh, maybe we put it out on our Facebook page. We've got to do something better as far as education <coughs> because everybody knows. I, I realize that this is spring cleanup time and people are burning fields and they're doing that, but call a dispatch to let them know that you're burning. And if the wind is already gusting, I mean, the other morning I got up and it was already 15 miles an hour. As a firefighter, you will not control a fire. I don't care how good you are unless you have the proper equipment there, you're not going to control it. So. Well, I mean, unless you've been unconscious for the last 20 years, you got to know. It's been out there. There are a lot of new people in this community, and maybe, These maybe that's are the situation. Um, been here for 50 years. We'll, we'll talk to the sheriff. We'll put out a Facebook blast. Uh, maybe we can put something on our website, too, and, and just let people know that, uh, you know, burning is acceptable. However, you do have to go through the process to let dispatch notes so the fire departments know um, and then we'll we'll take it a step farther with the sheriff if there's numerous complaints on this and nobody has even called in because there is a process and um, we, we can't let these things get out of control or they're going to get in there and mm -hmm. I mean look at what's happening in Boulder again with right. the in car fire it, it's the, the, the dry situation is real and people need to understand that specifically in the junipers and pinions. They need to also understand that they're liable for property damaged if it gets away. Okay. They're also liable for not following the land use code. Correct. So as Ian has explained that the penalties are real and they're substantial. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> it's the same as any, any land use code with violation within the county and so once we send them a letter, we can certainly file a complaint and move forward. Okay. So in my email, uh, I uh, addressed all the other departments and asked them to respond <coughs> to, to the complaint and copy everybody sooner rather than later. How many acres was that fire? No, they've been back there multiple times. I know that. I don't know that it burned that big of an area but it got into their slash chip pile so i mean it burned some some part of the hay field there was a previous burn pit that wasn't put out and was left unattended and with all the wind it took off again and i don't, I don't know because this is the first we've heard about their football size landfill trash deposit okay well we'll so deal we with the sheriff we'll check it out and then we'll we'll proceed from there if it requires something else and we'll have the attorney send him a letter and we'll start going down that and down mr that german has copied on that as well i read the whole thing last night so okay health department landfill sheriff's office two fire departments and a partridge in a pear tree. Um, with my response from planning for all their issues that they need to address. In red. Okay. So Very good. We'll, we'll then reach out to the sheriff and as you get those responses, send them to us so that we can see where they're at. Okay. I will. All right. Thank you. Okay, next we have our public comment session. The Board of County Commissioners welcomes you to this meeting. Person speaking during public comment will be limited to three minutes. 
or depending on the number of people wishing to speak, it may be reduced to allow all members of the public the opportunity to address the board. When addressing the board, please state your name and address for the record prior to providing your comments. And comments to individual supervisors or staff are not permitted, and participants may not yield their time. With that, the public comment session is open. Good morning. My name is Mike Lynch, and I live at 21730 Road S. Gentlemen, I hope you have been spending time reading through the information I delivered to you last week and the week before. Today I'm delivering an electronic copy of the Mesa County Report Number 3, Election Database and Data Process Analysis. That report states in the executive summary, quote, the findings provide evidence of unauthorized and illegal manipulation of tabulated vote data during the 2020 general election and the 2021 Grand Junction municipal election, close quote. There's a lot of information in the reports and other info I delivered to you. It's hard enough to read it all, hundreds of pages, let alone completely take in all that is explained there. Today I want to highlight for you something important. Forensic reports one and two were written by Doug Gould. His credentials are at the end of both those reports. He has an impressive bio. He looks like he's an expert in cybersecurity. I point or direct you to report number one. Introduction, bottom paragraph, page three. Quote, for example, some Colorado voting systems ordered as specified by the voting system vendors from foreign manufacturing and assembling facility facilities have included integrated Dell remote access <coughs> controllers, which are designed to allow out of band remote management of those systems, meaning that the computers are exp explicitly equipped to be controlled by remote automated programs or by individuals other than those logged in locally. Through the uh, remote access controllers, voting systems might have any aspect of their basic input output system, operating system, or applications controlled or modified, including the addition and deletion of user accounts, the enabling of communications components like wireless networking cards, and the modification, installation, removal, or configuration of software and settings. <laughs> I've confirmed that the EMS standard server, the first piece of equipment on the list given you last week for Montezuma County, has the same remote access controller installed as Doug Gould found in Mesa County. As I understand, this means EMS server can be activated remotely from the worldwide internet if that server is in a building with Wi-Fi internet in use, even if the county clerk and all her staff has not connected any of the equipment to the internet themselves, and it would have uh, happened without being detectable. You can just scan that, scan it and email it to us. Thank you. Next. Good morning. Um, I'm Lisa Vicchetti. I'm with Fish Pond Development, and I'm here to readdress uh, Sleeping Butte, which is the project that we're planning on purchasing and rehabilitating. Okay. I think we're still in public comment. Oh, we're, I thought this was part of public comment based on that. No, I, no I we're, can, we're still sorry, on yeah, public we comment. We have you down here where <laughs> you'll you'll have more than three minutes to address this if you need Got to. It. So. Sorry. This is, that's no worries, fine. thanks. That's fine. So, we are still in public comment. Anyone wishing to address the board, come forward, state your name and address for the record, and you have your three minutes. I'll get it this time. Good morning, folks. Uh, Alan Mays, 21693 County Road 21, Lewis. And, and I've been uh, here the last uh, couple of commissioner meetings, and I've heard that gentleman mentioned the concerns of um, uh, the Dominion machines and, and possibly the uh, happenings that have occurred with uh, uh, the electronic uh, issues and, and voter um, anomalies, I guess. That's, that's a nice word to say. I think there's been plenty of evidence that there has been some things done out there. And so I do want to offer that the information that is being put out there 
I've only touched on it a little bit and, and it does seem concerning, so I do hope that you will look at and um, take those um, uh, things seriously and, and then see what uh, can happen across the state of Colorado to help um, maybe improve our election integrity. So I just wanted to mention that as well. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, then we're gonna close the public comment session of this meeting and we're gonna to go to a special events liquor license. Miss um, Frizzell, we're talking about the Ute Mountain Ute Roundup Rodeo. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have an application for a special events permit for Ute Mountain Rodeo Roundup Rodeo scheduled for June 9th, 10th, and 11th at the Montezuma County Fairgrounds at 30100 Highway 160 in Cortez. And all the paperwork's in order. And this is kind of just semantics now. We approved this last week, right? This is the official document. Yeah, you had to give permission first right. for the liquor license, for liquor to be on fair board or fairground premises. Fairgrounds. That has to happen 30 days in advance of the event, and then she can bring forward. Once okay. she has the consent from the board, then she can move this forward. Okay. Which I do have already. That's uh, via our own red tape that we created. <laughs> I thought we reduced a lot of it. We have, but we've got some work to go. <coughs> you guys okay? Yeah. I move to approve this application for a special events permit for the Ute Mountain Roundup Rodeo at the Montezuma County Fairgrounds to have liquor there. Um, the malt, venison, spiritus liquor. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the application for a special events permit for the Ute Mountain Roundup Rodeo. Um, for dates of June 9th. 10th and 11th at the Montezuma County Fairgrounds for uh, the malt beverages. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. There you go. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, Lisa, if you want to come on down, you are actually on the agenda right now, and you can sit, you can stand, whatever makes you most comfortable. Good morning. Good morning. Lisa Caddy with Fish Pond Development. Can you um, make sure that mic is on and pull it real close to your? Can you guys hear me? There, yeah, there we go. go. Perfect. Thank you. I'll say it again. Lisa Vicchetti, um, out of Austin, Texas, with Fish Pond Development. Um, we spoke a few months ago. Um, you guys were kind enough to um, approve an inducement resolution for us for private activity bond allocation for Sleeping Ute, which is 60 units located here in Cortez. Um, I'm happy to say, and um, I think we've been updating you, that we did get that allocation from uh, DOLA, which is the state allocating agency for um, what they call the statewide collapse at the end of the year um, for all unused bond allocations. Um, so based on that allocation, we did make application to CHAFA, which is the agency that um, will go ahead and allocate tax credits to us, which is another source of funding for the property. Uh, we're right in the middle of that process. The reason why I'm here in person today is that CHAFA is actually going out to um, do a walkthrough of the property. So right after this meeting, I'll be running over there to meet with them um, to walk through the property and kind of go over what our plan is for the renovations. Um, I'm here today because um, the resolution um, that you guys provided um, was great. Um, it was for $3.5 million. When we went to um, the state allocated agency, uh, DOLA, they approved um, an amount from their statewide balance that was actually 
less than that. And the reason being is that they would like you to go ahead and also um, commit to your 2022 direct allocation that you're receiving this year. And um, the split out is $1,429,086 from that statewide balance in 2021. Oh, pardon. It's actually the opposite. $2,050,279 were awarded directly from the state from the 2021 statewide balance. They'd like the difference between that and the $3.5 million to be allocated from your direct allocation in 2022 of $1,429,086. So that's the request today, just to make that clarification in the inducement resolution. And I just want to clarify to the Board of Commissioners that um, there is no cash outlay from the county involved in this transaction. It's just the passing forward of state bonds and uh, the Fish Pond LLC has uh, agreed to compensate us for any staff time involved in making the adjustments. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Um, your uh, bond counsel is actually um, Fred Marenthal with uh, QTAC Rock. So he's been working with you. He's actually the one who put together this resolution. And we're the ones who'll be footing the bill for that, as well as any staff time that you bill to us. Okay. Any other questions? This is being purchased from Montezuma County Housing Authority. Actually, here. Montezuma County Housing Authority, they are a part of the partnership currently with um, Steel, uh -huh. um, who's a Colorado developer. They'll stay in the transaction with us, and they've okay. already agreed to partner with us again. Good. I would move we approve <coughs> resolution number 5-2022, a resolution of Montezuma County, Colorado, amending resolution number 16, 2021 by awarding private activity bond volume cap for the Sleeping U Apartments project. Second. Okay, that's been moved and seconded to accept resolution number 5, 2022, resolution of Montezuma County. Colorado amending resolution number 16-2021 by awarding private activity bond volume cap for the Sleeping Youth Apartments project. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And Lisa, can I just uh, email you the signed copy after the clerk notarizes it? Absolutely. Or seals it, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. And yep. thank, you. thank you. I hate to be rude, but I am gonna run over to the property now. <laughs> you, you can drive. <laughs> have, a, have a great day. Okay, next up we have Southwest Memorial Hospital, Rick Schrader and Jeannie Jeanette. Gentry. And Lisa Gates. And, all and right. Commissioners, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeannie Gentry, our new CEO. Right. And Lisa Gates, who's been part of the health system uh, for 12 years. And she's, she was named uh, CNO uh, back in October of 21. <laughs> things that are going on good at the hospital. Um, I, I did just join um, the community about two and a half months ago. I moved here from Idaho and I'm living um, right on Montezuma Avenue. So I'm pretty um, happy to be here. And so far, I just love this place. I, I love living here. Um, and this hospital is really in good shape. Um, I am pleasantly surprised. 
I know that we have been through some uh, difficult financial challenges the last few years. And they were very open with me about that when I interviewed to come here. Um, but the team has very much uh, overcome the obstacles that we had and um, hired a lot of great physicians to practice and PAs and nurse practitioners. Uh, we just have a, a really good team and um, I just feel very lucky to be here. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. I agree that we've got a great hospital here, yes. but I would like to just take a poll by show of hands. How many would rather be here than in the hospital this morning? <laughs> okay. Well, it depends. Well, I don't know. I'll tell you. Is, is the buffet you know, open? I was going to say, <laughs> the cafeteria serves a pretty good meal, believe it or not, and I've actually they, met with They've got a great breakfast burrito, and great breakfast when it's burritos. open, the best salad bar. Yeah. Yes, we do. We, we are spoiled rotten with our food. <laughs> that wasn't a fair question. That That's was a trick okay. question. I've actually, rather... I've actually had some meetings there in that cafeteria, and it, it's mm -hmm. actually, uh, actually a pretty good restaurant. <laughs> yeah, it is. So. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, we are still, um, I don't know, in a lull, in a COVID lull right now. Um, COVID has been a real challenge for every hospital in the country. And um, we, of course, have been through the ringer, especially our mm -hmm. clinical staff that take care of people that are sick. And there were many times, um, even recently, like December, January, where we used every bed and didn't have any more capacity to admit patients here. So um, we're glad that right now we do have capacity um, and we've got um, surgeries going on and everything. Uh, we're still uh, required to wear masks in a hospital, in a healthcare facility. So um, I'm sorry, you know, for those of you that dislike masks, I do too. But um, it's a requirement for us right now. Um, we still are under the requirement for um, our caregivers to be vaccinated for COVID or give us a reason that they cannot be vaccinated. And um, what is it, about 20% of our caregivers uh, had religious or health exemptions from having the vaccine. So um, we've only lost one or two people because of that who have chosen to leave um, because of the vaccine mandate that we were under. So um, we're uh, happy that we weren't like a lot of hospitals who dismissed up to 40% of their staff. I know places in other parts of the West that have lost a significant portion of their providers. Um, we are looking um, towards preparing for the next wave of whatever it is. Um, it won't be Omicron, it'll be some other variant. And uh, we don't know what that is, but we are trying to take this lull time to stock up and be prepared as best as we can. But one of the lingering problems is with um, getting supplies, getting medications, getting um, equipment, getting supplies for building um, repairs. You name it, we have shortages right now. And um, I know that that's a, sh a shortage everywhere. These guys just picked me up from the Dodge dealer in town where I dropped my truck off or probably something that the parts won't be there for six months. And the guys at the shop told me they have vehicles there that have been waiting over six months for repairs because of parts they can't get. And um, so please be patient with us as we um, look for alternatives. <laughs> but, Are you having any supply chain issues getting uh, things that you need for the hospital? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And, the, the, yeah. and so... Um, Mostly it's equipment, you know, anything with electronics, of yeah. course. But some supply chain issues. Um, so, so it's all from the manufacturers then. However, 
lot of it still exists. I mean, we ordered a, uh, we ordered, sorry, commissioners, we ordered a C-arm back in uh, December that's probably, it's an x-ray machine. Uh, that, that's used in orthopedic surgeries and things, and that, that probably won't be here until May or June. Uh, we've ordered a, a new DEXA scan for bone tensitometry uh, that probably won't be here until middle of June. So, so a lot of some of our, our bigger capital purchases, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've got a very strong materials uh, management department and, and, and all of our clinicians. We did stock up on a lot of the PPE, and uh, uh, but you know, we're we're basically at the list saying, okay, what what may be an alternative to go ahead and utilize. Yeah, so, and, and Rick, you remember uh, during uh, April, May 2020, right. when we had ordered the, we by we I mean you, had ordered the BD Max machine and yes, they sir. were stalling and stalling and stalling and right. the commissioners were able to get a hold of uh, Quorum and Catlin and yep. put pressure on the manufacturers and get that coming. So and, and we appreciate it, that it, help. If you're in need of something that you've sure. ordered, like not just it'd be nice to have, but you're in need of it. If you'd yep. let us know, I'm sure the commissioners would be happy to reach out yeah. on your behalf and put Absolutely. some pressure. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, we have two nine-inch C-arms, but we need a seven-inch C-arm. Uh, it gives better uh, uh, graphics and such. I'm going to let the, I ought to let the clinician explain it, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> but basically, it, it's a lot of uh, uh, just resolution and so forth to do some, some uh, deeper fractures. If Lisa explains it to you, She's probably going to explain it with a lot of good clinical terms. Mm -hmm. I try to explain, explain it in basic, simple English. Um, really, that's, I, that's it. I yeah. guess my ask would be that you yeah. uh, send a list of what you need and if flag sure. it by priority yep. and see if the commission can do anything okay. to give Thank you a you. hand getting that. And we've had great support from the uh, Colorado uh, uh, Rural Hospital Association, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Colorado Hospital Association, and then uh, we're part of a... Uh, 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 the Western Slope Hospitals, which is uh, Western Health Alliance, mm -hmm. so we've we've been, we've been blessed with good support with from you guys as well as uh, as well as our neighbors within the state. All of our um, advocates <laughs> seem to have um, really taken up the charge regarding rural health, um, and I'm impressed with the state, with the organization around rural health issues in Denver. Um, I just came from a state that's um, more interested in banning um, face masks than they are in, in the provision of health care. And, and I loved Idaho, but um, I, I'm impressed with the organization here um, to advocate for us and the things we need. Um, one of the things, you know that we have two boards, <laughs> as okay. you're aware. And um, the MCHD board has, um, it has decided to put a ballot initiative um, on the May ballot to um, ask the voters to please lift the sunset of the sales tax revenue that we are getting right now. Um, that revenue is very important to paying off the debt of the latest hospital project. And um, it sunsets at the end of 2030. And we would propose that that sunset go away and um, in lieu of that, diminish our mill levy by a quarter, by 25%. Um, the, the sunset um, then would not exist and we would have a stream of payments for the long term because that loan um, on the building, which is um, Southwest Health System, is on the hook for that loan, goes on till 2045. So um, doing away with that sunset would help us greatly. Right now the sales tax is paying about half the yeah, payments. It, it pays a little bit. Uh, and, and basically Sorry, the sales tax uh, last year paid about two million, two million, a little almost two million dollars at the three point six. Uh, this year, it, it's looking like somewhere around you know one eight to two million dollars, being con with conservative projections. So, uh, so it's very helpful, and that's that's where we can uh, utilize the variance to to kind of put back into equipment like ultrasound units, diagnostic imaging, uh, 
yes scopes for providers, things like that. They have, you know, the the the, the, the heavy dollar equipment stuff. So, so that's <coughs> that's why we came out and wanted to kind of visit with you and, and share with you a little bit about, okay, what are you guys doing with the Sunset? How does it benefit the residents of Montezuma County? And, uh, you know, if the county does vote to remove the Sunset, what benefit do county residents and property owners get out of it? And that's what we wanted to share with you guys a little bit today. Okay. Um, you, you've got our talking points up there, um, which were developed by both boards jointly. Um, we had some discussion at the beginning of uh, the, the wording of the resolution itself talks about maybe doing an ER project, OR, a bunch of different things. And um, we have not been through updated master planning. The master plan that we have for that property is, is based on 2015 plans. Um, pre-COVID, pre-financial pressures that we've had, and a lot of things have changed since then, not just building codes, although there are some of those, but, but um, some other things that are very um, important for us. So the MCHD board um, agreed that we won't move forward on any building projects or taking any debt on or refinancing any debt without the total agreement of both boards. And, um, and that, you know, theoretically includes management as well. Um, because we're all very sensitive about not taking on more debt right now after we've been in such a financial situation. Um, and the, the uh, things that were scheduled to be next construction, like the ER and the OR, um, we feel like our current facilities will be adequate for a period of time. Do you want to comment about that? Yeah, I think what Jeannie says is really important that we want to do updated planning and master facilities planning um, at this current time, um, not seven years ago, which is really important with this. Um, want to look at what our needs are in the emergency department as well as our surgical area um, is really important with also our staff input um, and more of a global feedback from our front and you know line staff members who work on that facility daily and know where our sinks should go our storage areas should go the simple things that really make your life different in patient care. So I think that's an important note of where we're at at this point with this ballot measure. So any questions that you have or that the public has, we're happy to um, share those. I've got extra copies I'll leave on the back table of the talking <coughs> points that you have I, up there. I think the question for me, and it's really to identify it for the, for the public is when when we talk about a mill levy compared to a sales tax, this weekend I found out that there are a lot of people that don't understand property tax, sales tax, mill levy, you start talking to them and they're looking at you with deer in the headlight looks and they're like, whoa, this, what, is, what does it all mean to me? Sure. So when you say you, you would be able to reduce the mill levy by 25%, I, I think that should be equated into dollars and cents. So the person that is voting for this is going to know, right. well, they're thinking it's going to go down 25%. Well, the mill is going to go down 25%. Correct. And I think it's just from what I sure. experienced this weekend, I think the average person doesn't have a clue yeah. of what that truly means. So um, <clears throat> although item number two states that, but what does that 25% a, a meal yeah. actually equate to. So j just a clarification no, for you guys, great, I think. Great recommendation, and we can, we, we wanna, uh, we'll go back and work yeah. with SHS and MCHD to use an example. For example, if your property's valued at 300,000, yep. this is what your current property tax is versus what it would be. Correct. As of after May 3rd or whenever it goes into effect. And, Correct. And, and, and it'd point. probably also be important to say only MCHD's uh, mill levy is, is going correct? to go down. The yeah. school mill levy, Not the county mill levy yeah. isn't going down. Yes, correct. And be real specific because yeah. 
the other thing that we found out too, when people look at their um, tax yep. roll, they look at it, they just look at the bottom number, they sure. don't look at the layers of it, uh, yes. and they're like, well, the county, county general, you're getting mm -hmm. the bottom number, and we're like, no, we get it into the treasury, mm -hmm. and then the treasury then has to submit it to all of these different Correct. districts. Yeah. We're way down the line as far as what we function on, so I'm just telling you yes, that sir. conversations I had this weekend, no, it's it's huge. The, the Civics 101 classes need to be happening, yeah. and we all need to be doing it together because, yeah, I mean, I would ask you right now, well, what does 25% mean to me? Right. And, and if, you, if you express sure. it in that way, I think you're going to be, okay. th they'll understand it better. Yes, sir. Um, and you're shifting some of the load from the property owner to the people that come and use our, all of our roads, right. facilities. And that's, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's right. So um, you, you do have enough data so obviously you can shift that mill by 25 percent mm -hmm. and still be okay yes. um which is good but i would put that you yes know, sir yeah those and, types and that's of one of the reasons we brought it to uh to you guys this group is to you know because i mean you guys you guys are out amongst the people and uh helping us with some clarification points thank you and, and then i'd like to take this opportunity to clarify too for the people in youtube land um when we dis have had discussions about possibly having a sales tax, uh, we've been hit often with, well, Montezuma County already has a sales tax, and uh, Montezuma County does not have a sales tax, but on people's receipts, it says Montezuma County HD, which is different. You guys do not work for us at all. We do not. <laughs> okay, just throwing that out there for YouTube land. <laughs> which, which is just part of the education that we yeah. have to do because right. we get that tossed into our face all the time well you already have it and no we don't it's right. a hospital district but they don't understand what the hd stands the for the delineation so of the government the governmental authorities correct the receipt printers won't put that amount of uh, text on a line okay yeah yeah and the mchd doesn't mean anything no they started spelling it out and they should have said it started montezuma county and then hospital. that's where it's done yeah. right. well We'll do our best to share that message as well. Yeah, um, thank you. I think one of the things we've learned is if we can get all of our employees to understand, <laughs> that's a good portion of, of the um, population here because they share it with their friends and their families and um, they are good advocates if they know and they understand it. So we'll work really hard with our people on that and with any communications that we have going out. Um, I think it's pretty clear that they would understand that it's a reduction both in a sales tax and a mill levy, but you know, the question that we always get, well, what does that mean? So yes. if, you, if you express it that way, uh, the other thing that they're gonna see is then it's now into perpetuity, and that's the other question to be able to ask or answer is, well, why do you need it into perpetuity? Yes. So that I think that's the that's the other thing that I'm asked all the time. Well, is there a sunset? You know, is it going to truly be a sunset, or is it going to be something that changes later? And you know, it's you always have to leave that to a different board twenty years down the road, or or whatever. This had a sunset sure. clause on it. Sure. So that's super useful information to the public because they really. Do not get it. understand um, the differences of, of, of how it's it's charged and layered. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything else that you wanted to share? I think you know Jeannie really touched on where we're at with the hospital. The last five months has been, you know, in our surge capacity with um, working with our state programs with transferring our patients to higher level of care, which are needed. We have gone back to um, our pre-COVID operations, if you will, of our transfer procedures, which is really working well. We have not had delays. Um, so I just wanted to update you there and looking forward to hopefully going, you know, treating our um, patients in more of an endemic instead of a pandemic mm -hmm. um, situation and really 
you know, looking at what our CDC and OSHA guidelines to try to make sure that, you know, we're giving all of the best care that we can for our community. But I did want to update you there as far as our operations at this point with the hospital. If you have any questions, please, you know, reach out to me at any point as well. How's, okay. how's your staffing? Our staffing is manageable. We do still have um, quite a few number of agency staffing that has taken a trend of being able to hire on actually over the last two weeks of permanent staff, which is a great thing as well. Um, really wanting you know to look at retention as well with our hardworking staff that have given all that they've had over the last two years to keep our hospital going. So you know as the next nine months progress, trying to really maintain our um, permanent staff and trend away from our agency staffing. Okay. Those are temp workers for you know in other industries we always have special names in healthcare for, for things but we have temp nurses right now um we have temp um where uh, else? Imaging, imaging specialists that they deal with radiology uh sleep lab uh, a couple of lab a lab, laboratory uh, technicians and so forth so we've got about uh, 15 15 all all in uh mm -hmm. yeah nursing nursing and, and other uh, other ancillary and clinical positions and this is a problem throughout the country as well when when covid happened um our demand for staffing went way up as a healthcare industry and so we all started asking for these temps from these agencies and they started trying to supply all of us and the law of supply and demand worked well and it drove the prices way up. And so a month ago we were in um, Denver talking with politicians about some of our biggest issues. And one um, was how much are you paying for a, a traveler nurse? Uh, we've been up to $170 an hour here for nurses, just to get a nurse in here. Um, but there were others in Colorado that had to pay up to 300 to get them to come to their place. $300 an hour is way more than we pay doctors, a anybody. It's, uh, it's not sustainable for us financially or any little hospital in the country. And I don't know what's going to have to be done about that. We're starting to see a little bit of a break with prices coming down, but we've actually had nurses leave employment here to go work for a traveler agency. They can't work where they were before, but they can go to Durango as a traveler and make, and make 170 bucks an hour. They don't of make 30. that much. The oh. agency <laughs> charges that much, but they'll make about half that. And that's really good money. And I don't blame them, of course, it's harder for people with kids, you know, so some of our core staffing have stayed throughout this, um, but, but we just can't keep doing this and we hope that we'll be able to find enough staff and utilize um, nurses aides and other staff and so that nurses can practice at the top of their game. I'd like to ask a question. You may not have an answer right now, but mm -hmm. when you're interviewing people to uh, come permanently, um, when people accept or reject a <coughs> position, do you get any indicators of uh, how things such as housing, uh, yes. school district, stuff like Absolutely. that affect their decision? And I, I know personally um, that she rental here. It's really family. Seven a month, if you can get it. That's yeah. an average. We met with the, mm -hmm. we, you know, um, uh, met with Senator Porum, and we met with uh, Mark Caitlin, Representative Caitlin, and then we got to talk to a few others because we, we what we were trying to do uh, when we went and spoke with the legislators is to try to legislators to have a feel mm -hmm. or get some kind of understanding of what it's like in rural Colorado because Colorado's more than just three to five counties. Rick, do you want to provide a quick update about our financing? Yeah, uh, do y'all have any other questions? I, no, that's good. I, I would maybe, if uh, it's cafeterias open, maybe have a meeting with you tomorrow sure. or, or any time. Yeah. Just, just give me a shout. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <coughs>
happy to send you a text. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. No, thank you. Um, I'll be I'll be brief uh, again. Appreciate everybody's time here. Uh, we had a we had a strong month for February, uh, even though it was 28 day month. Uh, we're continuing to uh, uh, collect cash uh, well uh, from insurance companies and patients. Uh, when the COVID hit the fan back in April, and we haven't talked about this in a few months, uh, we had a decision along with a lot of other hospitals: do we take the Medicare Advance funding, which they were going to uh, fund us about five and a half million dollars based on 19. Uh, 19 uh, funding as well for Medicare and at that point you would work it off it was kind of like a, uh, a front loan uh, that you can pay without interest uh, we've been paying that back since April of 20 very well so again through uh, the first two months of 2022 uh, we're ahead of budget uh, by about uh, $29,000 so uh, again uh, and we're meeting all our covenants uh, as we talked before relationships with make sure that you know who we are and invite you to contact us reach up the chain to the okay. state yes, and uh, see where we can get from there because yeah, we here in Montezuma County scream pretty loud when we're up there yes, sir. Um, yeah. so thank you <coughs> yeah. thank you very much <coughs> okay um, Next, we have our treasurer, Ms. Black, for our receipt of and disbursements. Good morning. Good morning, Ellen. Well, I assume you guys have a copy of this, or no? We do. Yes. Okay, so we're going to take that off the table. Yes. There we go. Okay. All right. So this is kind of old news, because this is the balance the end of December 21 the funds so normal thing any questions I, I think that again on on the bill that everybody gets they look at bottom number and they're like well that all goes to the county just from there oh. so when you start looking at the disbursements I, I think it's an education <sighs> piece of what it is but it is a little bit I don't know a little bit to get your head around turn the page and not yeah, even look yeah, at it. Yeah, so I'm live, yes. whether you're Pleasant View, Dolores, Cortez, right. Manker, People they People don't understand that, that, well, they do. Some of them do, I shouldn't say that, but not all. That, you know, when you voted in the new firehouse or the new library, you're paying for it. This mm -hmm. is it. And it, it <laughs> funded, huh? Yeah, that's it. You know, it seems to understand. Yeah, what I, I feel like there's taxes been are being kind of a gap for. where people used to really understand it and then... At that, and well, this is not a balance there. sheet. This is nothing more than disbursements. Right. This was so, just disbursements July through December. Um, if you want to touch on some of the other, though, the investment interest that shows on here, of course, that's down. I just looked at it yesterday, and it's down... 77% from two years ago, so uh, it's really Two years ago, out. is that Collar Trust? That it's we all were, our investments together. Um, so we were I about 2%. I just looked at all the investment <laughs> And then just from last year, it was down another 66%. So it's, it's down a lot. So that's kind of depressing. But then on the other hand, some of us don't like interest rates to go up. So, you know, based on our personal whatever. So... But when you're on the earning end, it does make a difference of several hundred thousand dollars on what we would have earned. And any other questions about anything while I'm here? Okay, I'll just get you guys to no. uh, How many special districts do we have total? Do you have any idea? No, I don't. Okay. Unless it probably does. I can I can tell you that not special districts specifically and and. Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she said we have 42 or 43 different layers of taxes yeah. total because there are different fire districts, cemetery right. districts, water districts, sewer districts. I mean, and my gosh, they start. they overlap or don't overlap, you may get more Right, on and yours. they lap in some and some, and some not school know. districts. So. And, and with that, uh, you know, we're even dispersing to the municipalities. Well, yeah, we're holding city of Cortez still, but. Right. Yeah. 
but yes, we do that. We do the cemeteries, the fire districts, all those are mm -hmm. on here and mosquito. Yep. Water. And the only Water. one that's going to be a little off um, from how this balanced was conservation trust. Right. And that's because they deposited someone else's money into our account and we didn't realize that wasn't ours. So and then when we went to file the report, they were like, we didn't do that. <laughs> but we were honest and we made them dig it, yeah. dig for it and take it back. I know. I don't know why somebody didn't miss that money. But anyway, so that's any other okay. questions? No other question. I moved to approve the schedule of receipts and disbursements for Montezuma County from 7 one to 12 31 21. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the schedule of receipts and disbursements from date uh, July 1st, 2021 to December 31st, July uh, 2021. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Commissioners, before we move to the next portion of the agenda, I did want to let you know that uh, Ken Curtis from DWCD did let me know he'd be unable to attend this morning. Okay. Well, <clears throat> then we will go to our water updates. And while you gentlemen are coming down, I'm going to go back and get me a drink of water. So come on down, Mr. Schwent, and Mr. Carver. And that's all I see. And Miss Rank. Right now. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good. Good morning. Bringing our moisture in with us today? Darn right. I'll All take right. credit. <laughs> take credit? Okay. Well, I'll give you both credit. How's that? Good. Okay. Well, where do you want to start? I shared with Shaq several things in terms of uh, to look at. And so what I shared were some family farm alliance material that I thought was good background that, that you might want to just have in your hands for reference sometime. And also then a draft of a uh, talk that I'll be doing at Southwest Seminar Friday. Okay. Then Ken had provided Shaq also with water supply numbers and the letter to Senator Bennett addressing the NCA. So I came today prepared to do a q and A. I I can talk from any of these things as you may want. may want to just, I want to use your time appropriately and, uh, so I can just start talking a little bit or if you want to give me some sense where you want me to go, uh, I'll well, go there. I, I'll, I'll let you uh, go where I think, I mean, my first questions are, I, I reviewed these last night and I've obvi obviously uh, read the, the letter to Senator Bennett. So, I think, you know, having some conversations with some other commissioners from San Miguel and uh, uh, Dolores County, I mean, I read this as a neutral statement, a neutral letter that they understand that the land use code or the land use 
portion of it below the dam is is good, valuable, uh, and but they still have some concerns as far as the language for everything in the storage capacities above. Uh, however, in the last paragraph of this, it, it's it basically to me says they're in a neutral position. Is that am I reading it correctly? Um, my quick summary of the letter, and given the history of how it all unfolded, that I'll, I'll, I'll start with the opening sentence or, or paragraph, somewhere in the beginning. The DWCD not, didn't just participate, they probably initiated yep. the NCA discussion in the hopes of wild and scenic protection in that NCA legislation. So, with that foundation, then where we've ended up is we still haven't got good water language in the first time around and it's it's not there yet so it's basically a good land use bill but it's not a good water bill and water is what we're of course mostly concerned about with DWCD and the water providers and so we respect Senator Bennett highly uh, we're still not given up on getting some water language fixed as part of that. Oh, I don't know whether neutrality would be exactly the right word, but I, I've got to just let the letter speak for itself. Sure. But it's still, the, the, that, that's my over, my simplification. Right. Here. But the way I, I read it was not that. not good for water. And so we, we're going to work with Senator Bennett. He should, he's, he's strong water supporter. Right. comes to Water Congress regularly, knows his stuff. So we're still hopeful that uh, we can maybe get the water language. So fixed. if this passes in its current state, then the management plan, or I'm not quite sure if that's truly what they call it, but then that's what starts to be developed in the next one, two, maybe three years. I don't know if it would take that long. I, but I, wouldn't that, isn't that where that really gets delineated, where the language where, where, I'll, where I will answer your question there, Jim, if I could. Yeah. As I've seen Shaq cycle through the document, mm -hmm. the family farmland stuff, let's not go there today. Yep. But literally the Southwest Seminar Talk and the summary that I've chosen and how I've chosen to frame where we are. And before we even go to the sim summary talk, water supply. So do you want a little longer answer as I circle around you, here? You have all the time you want today. Because as you look at what we had last year for a project supply, and then what our pr projections are today that we can share with our users. Yeah, that, this is the forecast for supply by the end of the year. And the reality is that uh, the 90% on each side in other words, the 10% on the top side for, for uh, getting to there is, is the high end of water we may receive. The 90% at the low end is uh, the low end. But those are not, either one of them, out of the question today. We never used to look at 90 and 10% as being in play. 50% is median. I think it's median as opposed to average. And the 70 and 30% up are where you might expect things to go. And in the last two decades, and particularly the last 10, what we've watched unfold absolutely is 70 cent. 70% 70 is probably the better forecast than anything, than even the 50. But how do our users deal with a potential supply of 2% of project supply with the 90% at the bottom compared to 100%? And the project was built on full service supply, all project supply, never being less than 50%. And yet we've had a number of years that have been less than 50%. So the reality is, here it is, the day that we should be, well, by Monday of next week, the youth should be able to be pulling water into their farm and ranch. And these are the projections that they get a plan from. Mm -hmm. So that poor hydrology Bill shouts to me the summary that I gave here. We need more flexibility in the future. We don't need locked in. And what we've done right here is, is absolutely what we were supposed to do to live in the Western United States. Mm -hmm. And literally in 
here again now, if this is me and my close to 40 years here on working with the Dolores Board, we've been under a demand of the lower Dolores from below McCree from the day I got into this water board business, where they've had big eyes, as I talked about. They could, they realistically put on the table in my history, close to 90% of the yield of the project is absolutely what they needed to have for their minimum down the river. That's P. Hat Sim stuff, not how it was done in the state, complicated story. And so we've got to change our attitudes. Where I'm really going, NCA, all of the attitudes towards water are to lock in the status quo and take away our needed flexibility. So you talk about in your summary, if I read this mm -hmm. appropriately or properly, I, I think in the, in the most near future, you talk about the force health in there. And isn't that something that we can focus on and work? The most near future, what? Well, for, forest health. I mean, even Absolutely. just our free Adify Absolutely. program, because we're conserving water Ab and getting it back into these flows, because that does change hydrology also. So oh. I think yeah. it's not just about storage, no. which is more long-term because of the way it takes to get these projects built, which they may or may not ever get built. but. The, the, you know, we are aggressively working with that. You know, we just had a meeting with the Congresswoman last week here. Um, that's right here. I, I guess that's in the near future. That's something that we can grasp. We can make work and go forward as far as educating the people and then getting rid of them or eradicating them. And then forest health, which again, like, like you said, t t too, too many trees, unhealthy forests, not enough grazing to keep the fires done. There's just, I, I guess is that, what do we need to focus? I, I know that water and these numbers are all based on this hydrology of what we have currently, but if we change the hydrology by getting rid of some of this other stuff. We need numbers. That's been what my mantra. Mm -hmm. We need a, a, a water number that comes with forest health. Daryl and I have had these conversations and our board and the whole water community. And, and we talk about that a lot. But I'll just sh share a couple quick quotes, anecdotal quotes kind of, out of neighbors, people that we're all at the water table with. First I'll go to uh, a good TU representative that's a reasonable person, good to work with, knows her stuff. But I think I'm getting her quote about right. I'm not going to cut another trees for water. Wow. And then that's on that side. It's this mentality that we need, need to change. But it's not a tree, it's a weed. Well, here's then the, the, on the other side. I heard Don Corum interviewed in his campaign for the third congressional on this very issue. And I wish I had a copy down. I don't have his numbers in my head, but he's got it out as a sound bite number. How many trees are up there in a range of trees that are alive today? And it's just a huge, a big number, I hate to throw it out because I don't remember, but it, a healthy forest was so significantly less than that in the number that he threw out. And that's what we need to have. Okay, and so I just want to clarify, I think we're we talking about two numbers? different trees. I think we're talking well, Russian we're, olives we're talking and tamarisk. Yeah. Talking He's talking, talking, talking yeah. pine yeah. and yeah. Yeah. The whole watershed, of course. Yep. And that's what we're talking today, absolutely. Correct. Get grass under there that cows can graze and will, and keep it from being a fire hazard. But as you, what I'm after then, when we reduce to the number of trees that Corum suggested, we ought to reduce and is what we are. How much water do we, is that gonna yield? Mm -hmm. My hope is, many of our hopes, Gerald's and my kind of, we've said it out loud. Give us that water back, and instead of being, sitting here at this less than 50%, we may be, kicking the water into McPhee where a year like this with 100% snow still varying slightly as we're moving in, we'd be looking at at, at, at least this 41% of, of supply and maybe better. What, but we, so let's get the number right. on that. So we have that numbers part. for the county. Um, now we're, we're talking about our free Adify program, not yeah. the forest right. because that we don't manage that. So we don't have those numbers. But if you can get that data 
And then the numbers that we actually have that our, our noxious uh, weed department puts together because we just went through this slideshow, are those numbers calculated into this report? We, what, I, what I'm saying, the, the, my advocacy, that's in, and that's why I brought the Family Farm Alliance stuff. Mm -hmm. It's because they're the really good ones <coughs> at the national level to really get that stronger, really big advocacy. But we've got to get numbers for all of forest health activities as it, you transition over time with sure. trees growing and doing their thing and keeping it healthy and how that cycles and get a firm yield that we could plan for. We don't have that. That groundwater component of the science that's, that, that the trees are pulling from the groundwater before it gets to the stream, all of that science is the most difficult thing for us to understand that we don't have the data on to tie them together. Stream flow to all of that groundwater stuff. <coughs> okay. Well, we'll get, we'll get you our numbers and our data for not trees, but some people are going to call them trees. They're now they're actually. I just I want to, to me that's a really critical point. Mm -hmm. That's today's soundbite stuff and talking points that we need to move forward to help us all. Because I'm not about ready to give up that Forest River isn't going to provide enough for at least the, the juniors and seniors and all of us on this side. And because I'm going to go to a different point if I could. Okay. That's made here and here again. This is a point where. We don't know compared to what we have in the weed trees in our riparian areas, Russian olives, tamarisk, do their thing. It's really valuable to our community as well. A lot of it's based on those kind of water environments that are just kind of sitting out there in limbo land. That we've got to be thoughtful about moving forward, not locking up our water supply, be going a different place. So that kind of summarizes in, in large part where, what I tried to pitch and what I want to present today, we can go into more detail, more Q&A. Okay. Gentlemen, question college at all? We'll never claim to. Actually, we'll put more water uh, that we're self-sustaining all the time. I think that's, that's by far the most critical thing. Um, and then obviously, you know, looking at storage up above, but data, you know, it, it, they go in 15 foot increments, right? They go the first 15, the next, 15, which is 30, and then by the Tuckers are. I, I mean, on the Arkansas, your deep tap rooted tamarisk are pulling a ton more, pulling that much more than your than your tamarisk. I think that's some shallow science based on some bias, because I can look at tamarisk right now, and uh, just within a less than a mile of my farm, up a hill, Ray is in these old ditches coming down to feed some ponds that are still alive and well with a deep tap proof and there's no water up there. Mm. But anyhow. Uh, but the fact is you can't grow cottonwoods in as dense a monoculture as you can Russian olive. Exactly. Correct. And so the natives need, I mean the non-natives need, need to be go and we will gain water with the natives is my point of that. But expanding on that slightly to just picture discussion, augmentation water. Mm -hmm. Literally in uh, the drought contingency plan that we went through with all of this Lake Powell stuff. Augmentation water looked at riparian water, natives versus non-natives dialogue, as new able to augment, bring water and get you. And if, if, if the South Flats got to provide what they do, bring. But someplace we've got to change our mindset where we do a, a plan to grab some Mississippi water. CAP, CAP was originally authorized with the full intention of, as CAP got your uh, CAP built, that Columbia River was. So, our food. speaking of our pre outified wanting right. to really go there. But literally, I, the news story came out, and I knew, I've known it was going to be coming from CWCB, where demand management officially on hold that story out that. Uh, to let the lower basin know because they just were ignoring any help from Powell as they did that. And so in the lower basin, they've got their plans with strong support from, uh, from uh, federal government, Bureau of Reclamation, Water Smart grants and stuff to fill this 500,000 acre foot of pool in Mead to keep it up by buying some water from different entities down there that are willing to put on the table. But I was on a, 
on a Colorado River workback group, the one that really put together of the family farmer lines, put together uh, this policy that, that we put, that the, the board has now approved, figuring out, because this is all finally getting where we, we can publicly lay it out, trying to figure out where we go next. But there's th that, they're still having a, a little bit of trouble grabbing all of the water that they want for that 500,000 acre foot pool driven by some farmers are backing up because of the Ukraine situation and the food supply situation and price of commodities going up enough that they might not want to get quite a bit of dollars for their water and quit raising the crop because they, the country needs the food and we need it today. Yeah. I mean, to, and it's that whole issue where we're a little behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. So we're still having a hard time adjusting to the reality, Shaq, but the two basins are adjusting differently now. And so we'll see where it all ends up going. I won't be surprised if uh, they have to do some emergency response on, on uh, finishing, getting ready to, uh, or, or not living on what Powell and Mean are doing without somebody on each side, which price means the lower basin way more than the upper basin when we mm -hmm. don't have the water to give it. We just don't, unless the hydrology gives it. So they're gonna have to be doing some heavier cutting down there than anybody's contemplated even before the 26, 26 guidelines are done. That may be out on the limb. That's not said publicly by anybody. I might not should have said it in this mic today. But, but that's my personal read of where the but hydrology could take us. Nobody, okay. everybody's still hoping the hydrology's gonna come back. And sure, well we can, we can all that we can manage and the things that we can do. So with that, Randy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now kinda Good. give you guys some equal time here. Not, I'm not, not gonna compete with that. Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to watch the time and then kinda give you guys, I. I was just, I, I had read the information that you had sent to us, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, because it's so hard for me to understand a lot of this stuff is why I have to ask so many questions. I'm not, uh, I, I feel just ignorant at times because of, there, there's so much there. So um, I, I do ask a lot of questions. So Randy, I'm gonna turn it to you now and, uh, Kind of, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Don, reading the letter from DWCD. I, I still read it as neutral. Uh, as if this does pass, uh, the NCA uh, seems to be appropriate for our area at this time, and that you know obviously you would be at the table uh, to establish the the management plan. And again, if that's not the right term, then you were wanted to give it. Correct me, first, but because I, <coughs> that, Absolutely. I still think, gentlemen, that you three commissioners and the stance you take could help Dolores to stance on on an improved NCA. Mm -hmm. If where you are compared to us could be a big deal and very useful, and it can get the, wherever we can get in the future together, good or not. But just make sure that you understand that. Doris needs to stay where they are and watch how everything unfolds, but wherever you three go publicly and between now and then, um, that's going to have an impact as well. Okay. It seems to be coming down to the drafting of the management plan again. I still think that the legislation's a place to continue our focus, Kent, until we just, until we know that that's where we have to go next. Okay. Okay, Randy. I really don't have anything. I mean, we had around two round tables. They're both Zoom, and it looks to me right now they're kind of in a who wants money for local projects. That's kind of where they're around. Is that? We do. We want your money for local projects. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's. <laughs> Well, that's that's what Bonnie does. She she does submit grant applications through that, and that's uh, a big deal. I mean, there's some really good projects, but there's some other projects that would enhance, a, like Pagosa. Remember that project? They're going to do a downtown beautification project. Mm -hmm. it's, my mind is not there, but I mean, that's part of a, uh, I guess, urban planning that would bring people to community. So I'm not against it, but my mind doesn't go to those places. My mind goes to investment in, in 
water structures. And so I, you know, when I saw that Gretchen was supposed to be here, I was looking forward to that because I've heard, <coughs> I appreciate all the people that like cattails and cottonwoods, swampy areas and all that <laughs> because it is part of our culture around here. But mm -hmm. with the shortage of water, I mean, I don't want my water going to them cattails. I want an efficient transportating system where I can get all the water that I have allocated to me to my head gate and I can use it the way I want it. So when we're talking about um, the culture of we want cattails and groundwater, that doesn't equate to what the laws are on the books. We, MVI and DWCD, they have certain laws they have to abide by. And, you know, irrigable acres and the contract with the Bureau, that's what matters. The, all the other stuff is just kind of a, I want things to not change attitude. So we've got to balance that. I'm not saying that I want things to change. I'm saying that in the structure of the laws and what's going on with Las Vegas and all the things, the pressure's going on to us, we still have to focus on getting more efficient with mm -hmm. our water because we have less of it to deal with. So that's, that's my whole spiel. I agree. Efficiency and, is huge. And Randy, you know I don't disagree with you at all on, on how we have to do that. My point is where I've got more public and calling it cattail swamp yeah. and whatever else is to emphasize the point when, that, was, that I also put in my story. 77 drought, which is came. Mm -hmm. I started farming in 75 and had three farms by the time the 77 drought hit. And with two weeks of direct flow water from MVIC in that spring of 77, I still raised a pretty good crop on my two lower valley farms. That was, I didn't know it then. Yeah. I do now, solely based on the groundwater storage yeah. that MVI's irrigation had done prior to that. Absolutely. And so we have to be strategic, yeah. is the word I use to rebuild groundwater storage where we can. Because if we're gonna be looking at a more volatile, you know, and laws always make it harder. Yeah. And I, I don't agree with that. You can't get cows through there. You, you can't fight fire in there. And, you know, even when fire's reintroduced, you go up, up above Dolores and you see all that oak brush that's, that's coming up. Yeah. Oh, man. You, you could, nobody can walk through there. My point still is, it's our job to manage it. Yep. That's, and it takes money to manage, and it takes way more money in today's world to manage than it ever might have used to. But we, that's our responsibility. So we figure out a way to do it. Which is why here in Montezuma County, our noxious weed department and our department, and, and I want to use the term, I think it was 750 acre feet. feet which there's approximately 350,000 gallons of water in an acre foot equates to, and I'm going off of her slideshow, but it's millions of gallons of water that we have conserved, which then gives it back to our uh, agricultural community. And I think that's huge of, of what we're doing as commissioners. For Club 20, the biggest focus of our Forest Service now is in the San Juans. And they are doing stuff. They are, I don't know how much you guys have been up there the last couple of years. The creation they're doing in the state of Colorado right now is right here. And they're, yeah, they're actually thinning trees and doing something here, which they haven't done in 40 years. But we're still not measuring the water. And that's where the, the staff that Ken Curtis has just put on with us, we've got some kids that bring some of that knowledge set we can take their knowledge. I'm working Ken and our staff to, to put that together and reach out to Steve and to Roundtable to find the money to get the science to really use this opportunity as being the leader in building the template of what I advocated for mm -hmm. earlier. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you guys. Appreciate it. This, I mean, this is really important. I mean, this is it's up well, there. Water, water, like I said, I, I think is the top 
three in the state of Colorado that we <coughs> hear and that we're dealing with all the time is, is water. So Thank appreciate you for it. The opportunity. You bet. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> moving right along now, we're going to go to uh, some unfinished business. Uh, first of all, we have Dustin back here uh, and Mr. Spratlin. I don't see Mr. Spratlin, but Dustin, um, you can come on up. He ended up um, having to deal with another issue. We do have all of your uh, information that you have sent to us. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for doing that research. It looks kind of like what I thought might might be better to have natural gas and obviously even just uh, uh, cost wise it looks like that's the better by far the better value to go so I'll give the floor to you Dustin and you can explain these to us so that everybody understands them um, the first one is if we set an above ground tank we would do, we'd move the generator and set it and then the electrician would hook it up and then we'd go ahead and uh build a fence once everything's complete to keep everybody out that doesn't need to be in there. Um, the second one would be bearing an underground tank and it's six to 18 months out for a tank. And then the line would be a lot further and all that. And then the last option is to go with natural gas and they're willing to install the gas line and set the meter for the cost of um, asphalt repair. And, and so commissioners, in the capital budget, we budgeted 30,000 for this project. Um, anything below 50,000, we do not need sealed bids. We need competitive prices. I believe that um, Dustin has done his due diligence to show uh, what's needed. So now in order to move forward, we need a vote of the commission. One thing that I, I had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Spratlin yesterday after our um, workshop. So just so that the public knows that if something catastrophic, some catastrophic event happened and natural gas was cut off for some reason, we do have portable propane tanks that we could convert this, move a portable propane tank and actually have the generator back up and running in very, very little time. Yeah, but that yeah. would be something major, catastrophic, yeah. beyond most people's imagination. So uh, obviously this is a patent uh, gas supply. And, and again, I thank you for doing your, your homework and it, it definitely looks like the best um, solution to me. So gentlemen. I make question? a motion we proceed with the uh, administration generation project. For the na with natural gas. With natural gas, yeah. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the administration generator project with natural gas as proposed to us. In favor? Aye. 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 Do you have I one do. to sign? I have one. Sign. And then, Miss Kim, if you don't mind, um, just getting that over to Gina when you're done with it. Gina. Montoya. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. And then it. yesterday, gentlemen, we, uh, we've hired our economic development coordinator out of our Department of Social Services, and she had, uh, Jessica Thurman had been appointed previously as the representation from the Department of Social Services to the Southwest Opioid Response District. And uh, it is required in the intergovern intergovernmental agreement with the Attorney General, try saying that five times fast, um, to have a representative from all departments of social services within the region and Ms. Montoya presented to us um, yesterday that she would like to appoint Annie Diaz to fill that position. It would be a two-year term, and uh, you've all seen video of her testimony, so at this point, y you can choose to do that or not. I would so move we appoint Ms. Diaz to the SWORD board for two years. Second. 
Okay, it's been moved and seconded to appoint Annie Diaz to a two-year appointment to the SWORD. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next we have our Child Abuse Prevention Month Proclamation presentation. Um, Ms. Jurgensen, Ms. Yazi, I see you in the room. Come on, come on down. You're on. Make sure that's turned on. Nope. Tur there we go. And just okay. pull it for closer to you. That way you don't have to lean over. Like leaning. <laughs> um, I'm Rose Jurgens, and I am um, the executive director of the Four Corners Child Advocacy Center here in Cortez. I'm here on behalf of the Child Maltreatment Prevention Action Team. Say that one. Five child Maltreatment yeah. yeah. Prevention, child action maltreatment maltreatment prevention, prevention Action Team. Action team. Um, we're a work group of Team Up United Way Southwest Colorado and our goal um, with the goal of ensuring that every child in the community is in a safe and supportive environment. April is nationally recognized as Child Abuse Prevention Month and we would love to see you all dedicated leaders um, in this effort to prevent child abuse. Uh, child abuse is real and prevalent uh, according to the most recent kid, Kids Count data in 2019 the average rate of child abuse in Montezuma County was 18.9 per 1,000 with the state average being 9.7 um, that's nearly double 18.9 as opposed to 9.7 so we do have a real problem further 90 percent of abuse happens at the hands of a family member or a close family connection um, the good news is that the majority of child abuse is preventable um, and requires involvement of the community to prevent. We're requesting that the commission formally decree April's Child Abuse Prevention Month. The signed pro proclamation will demonstrate your support for fighting child abuse and neglect within our community and encourage fellow community members um, to support, ah, yeah, I didn't touch it. I didn't touch <laughs> to be supportive of families. Uh, raising their children in a safe and nurturing environment. So we appreciate your consideration in supporting prevented effort, preventive efforts um, of child maltreatment in our community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll just add just a few more words. First of all, thank you, Shaq, for getting us on the agenda so quick. We just reached out like yesterday, <laughs> and he was able to get us on. And um, just to add to this and kind of connect it with some of our other work, um, you know, children who experience higher adverse childhood experiences when they're younger, um, which could be child abuse, could be maltreatment, could be neglect, um, do tend to have, um, there's a correlation between those, the number of uh, ACEs and um, future suicidality and, and stuff like that. So um, it definitely ties in with our work with suicide prevention and of course hearing um, from leadership in the community that child uh, um, child abuse prevention is, is a major um, thing for our community and trying to change the norm around who's responsible for it, which is all of us as a community are responsible for child um, abuse prevention and child maltreatment prevention. Um, it speaks loudly when it comes from leadership. So we're really glad that um, you all are considering this proclamation and we are asking other, other municipalities um, in the community to proclaim as well. And, and the tribe as well. And the tribe, I, yep. No mistake. And in, normally before uh, a proclamation, we do read it into the record. Okay. So, um, whereas preventing child abuse and neglect is a community problem that depends on involvement among people throughout the community, and whereas child maltreatment occurs when people find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and don't know how to cope, and whereas the majority of child abuse cases stem from situations and conditions that are preventable in an engaged and supportive community, and whereas child abuse and neglect not only directly harms children, but also increases the likelihood of criminal behavior, substance abuse, health problems such as heart disease and obesity, and risky behavior such as smoking, and whereas the people of Colorado should become involved in supporting families in raising their children in a safe, 
nurturing environment, and whereas effective child abuse prevention programs succeed because of partnerships created among social services agencies, schools, faith communities, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community, and whereas child maltreatment knows no social or economic boundaries and occurs in every neighborhood in America. Now, therefore, we, the Montezuma County Board of County Commissioners, and in such capacity, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2022 as Child Abuse Awareness Month. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, Commissioners, would you like to move that forward? Go ahead, Chair. I move to approve this proclamation for Montezuma County for Child Protection and Abuse Month Second. for April. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the proclamation uh, for the month of April 22, April 2022 as Child Abuse Awareness Month. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Sure. Sure. Zach will get his crayons out and he'll get it right. <laughs> Do you need both of these signed? Yes, please. Just one for her and one for me. Okay. Okay, well, we have now come to an executive session for legal advice. Uh, we actually have two items of discussion. So, Ironwood and, uh, Commi and Commissioner, Commissioner what, what we need to do on this is we need to go into one executive session to receive come legal out. advice on the fiber network, then we come out, and then we're going to have to go back into executive session for okay. legal advice on uh, I just wonder, would it make sense to do the ostracized reports in that way? These people can stay for the reports and then. Sure, we can, then we'll go to the attorney's report. We're gonna put those at the last so that people here can leave if they need to. Um, attorney's report. Um, I don't really have anything new to report, commissioners. Um, at, at this point, um, everything's just kind of hanging where it was last week. Okay. Um, James has nothing. Um, Shaq, we'll go to your report. Okay, the first thing I have for the uh, commissioners is the generator for the crusher has uh, given up the ghost. And uh, so since it died, the uh, parts to replace it are about uh, at least eight months out and a, a bunch of work. So in the meantime, we are renting a generator at $5,000 a month. So. Um, the road department put together prices to just uh, replace the generator. Then they have money for this in the crusher budget. Um, everything is below 50000 so sealed bids are not required. They did get uh, competitive bids. They have a, an Olympia um, and three different Cummins, one from United Rental, one from Central State. 
Um, and so the low bid on this and what the road department would ask for is uh, 29,000 for the Olympia and then it's going to take another thousand to convert it to the kilovolts that they need and so I would ask the commission to approve um, the Olympia generator source uh, um, generator in the amount of $30,000. I would so move. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the price quote for the Olympia 200 kW generator with 30 hours on it in the amount of $30,000 or not to exceed $30,000. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oops. And then what do I have next for you? Um, there's a, a state law that we've received some clarification on uh, that now requires um, that uh, sick time be paid for part-time employees. And uh, if you've got questions about the law, you feel free to ask uh, our legal counsel about that. He can explain that. However, uh, as it is, would be accrued time for part-time employees now, we do need to incorporate it as part of our handbook. And so I would ask that the commission approve uh, a handbook amendment uh, that it would be uh, section 4.5.2. Required to um, provide an hour for every 20 hours worked. Um, it's I think it's an hour for every 30 hours worked is, is what the law requires. But in this county for all of our employees, this is the calculation we use. And so this would keep it consistent across consistent the board. Consistent with our employees. Exactly. Okay. Questions, gentlemen? No. Okay. Move we approve the amendment to the policy handbook to include 4.5.2. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept and add uh, 4.5.2 uh, for the sick leave policy for hours worked of 20 hours for sick time. And just to clarify, this is to the employee handbook. To the employee handbook. Added. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, next check. And uh, then I would uh, ask the commissioners um, to approve the payables for the month of February. You saw social services portion of that that you approved last week. This is the county um, portion. So um, the total payables for the month of February altogether is three million seven hundred fifty thousand nine hundred seventy nine dollars and twenty five cents. I move to approve the payables for the Board of County Commissioners, Montezuma County, for February first, twenty twenty two to February twenty eighth, twenty eighth, twenty. And then. Um, that would allow at uh, n it would be a software uh, cloud-based software that would allow us to open on anything one concern that I have is that it would require I'm not sure I'm not sure how they'd feel about the, using a tech source to do their bidding so um, I know they're probably going to hound me for a decision I, I don't think that until we've done some research to find out you know, how local bidders um, like uh, our roofing companies and our electricians and stuff, how they would feel about the site. The, I don't think that we should move forward with it at this time, but I'm happy to reach out to them and do the research if that's something that the commission wants me to do. So I'll give you my two cents on this. So. Um, I actually use a couple of these platforms that uh, PTAC is one of them uh, in the past that they send these types of procurement uh, documents for uh, work that they want done, whether it's, I mean, it could be a, uh, just a roofing job, it could be a parking lot, it could be uh, an entire structure, but you only get these types of platform if you sign on and um, 
basically subscribe to this platform. So I don't know how many of our local people do do this type of work. Um, so I don't, it doesn't mean that we would exclude them. It just means that we would be able to, it, it could go out broader. So we might get uh, different vendors from different areas because this is a, this is a platform for all vendors. I mean, it could be, it could be anything. So I don't, I'm not sure. It, it is a 1% cost to the, to the vendor. With a cap of 50,000? Correct, with a cap of $50,000, which is still a lot of money to pay to subscribe to something. I don't know. I don't know if really in our area, if we need something like this, I think in a bigger county it might might be more critical, but I'm not necessarily sure that um, at this point in time, I'm not saying that it wouldn't eventually work, but I'm not sure that it would really work um, right now for us. It would give opportunity for outside people to look at both sides and, and evaluate. It is no cost to us, a broader, um, a broader area. Do you know of anybody in our region using these people? Potential, while it was fresh in my mind. I to look at it, we can kind of go through the, some of the, you know, the platform that they have there and then you can, we can evaluate it in a couple weeks. Okay, all right. Okay, and then um, I wanted to, I, I briefly alluded earlier that the county had uh, hired an economic development coordinator. Her name is Jessica Thurman. She started yesterday. Um, she's currently right now working with, uh, she's not working for Region 9. At this exact moment, she's working with Region 9 on some projects. I don't know if that makes sense. So. Um, to the public, uh, you'll be seeing her somewhat often. And then on Friday, um, I sat with, uh, and uh, there was a uh, bill going before um, the legislature that was uh, moving from committee, um, well, trying to move from committee. CCI took an amend position. It was on behavioral health and the creation of the new Behavioral Health Administration, some of the things that uh, were involved in that. CCI did take an amend position. Some of the things uh, that were of concern in the bill was that it would uh, take community uh, behavioral health centers out of state statute. So in essence, Axis is the one in our region. And it don't fixed uh, within the behavioral health community, but one of the things uh, was to take them out of statute, stuff like that. I'm not sure how that's a fix. So um, other things w would be requiring extra. Re I just want to speak on behalf of uh, my wife, who's a nurse. She's uh, creating a solution on that. And, you know, my wife is not a whiner. She doesn't mind doing her job. But that three to four hours she's spending on paperwork is three to four hours that she's not spending on patient care. And, um, you know, like I said, she's not a whiner. In fact, she's leaving next Wednesday, so I'll be gone next Monday and Tuesday. Um, she's leaving next Wednesday to uh, volunteer without pay, going with the mission group to uh, Eastern Europe, and she'll be running medical supplies in and wounded people out of Ukraine. So she's obviously not afraid of work. Um, but I don't think that adding to the bureaucratic red tape is necessarily the best solution for fixing the health care system. Um, I would be interested in reaching out to the clinicians, nurses, providers, and seeing what they think are some of the red tape hurdles that are keeping them from providing the service that they'd like to um, see provided and see if we can amend a legislation that would actually help accomplish the goal instead of just add red tape. Um, so I'll climb off my soapbox about that, but CCI did take an amend position on that bill. And then um, a couple of weeks ago when the fire departments were here uh, talking about the need for a public safety sales tax, um, they had asked since they'll be taking over the fireworks if uh, they had asked for support um, 
my understanding at the time was a letter of support, but they actually want financial support. Um, I don't know, and the chairman just walked out. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know where the commission wants to uh, stand on that, if you're ready to make a decision, if you want to make an amount, or if you think it would be better if you all just gave personally instead of using county coffers for that. I think it'd be better if we just gave personally. Yeah, I do too. I know there's a lot of corporations that give, a lot of, I mean, the banks, businesses all get hit up. But being we're in the economy we're in right now, I mean, uh, do Cortez, Mancus puts on a show. I think Dolores puts on a show up in Dolores. So if you I, I think one, Rico does too. Yeah, Rico. Well, that's different county, but I think we would be hit up more than once. I think it'd be better if we just stayed personal. And okay, and um, so I should tell them to call you all personally. I already have a letter in my uh, that was slipped <laughs> under my door at my business. So. Uh, no problem, and I'll probably give some to that as well. And that will uh, conclude my report, unless there's any questions from the commissioners on anything I reported on. No. Uh -huh. We can, we can start our commissioner's report because this guy next to me, he's probably going to have a long one. But uh, Mine started out uh, first week we went to uh, city council. And as we heard with the hospital today, uh, their supply chain problems are just as long or longer than anybody's. They're having trouble with vehicles and beds for trucks and, and everything else. But what sort of stood out in that meeting was some of the numbers that uh, Judge Padilla has been putting together. And I'll, I didn't, I left those in, at my house and I didn't bring those, but uh, she's put together some pretty good numbers uh, about uh, alcoholism and addictions and stuff through her court, which I'm sure manifest into ours. Um, city Council, uh, the Mayor Mike Levy and uh, Orly Lucero, that was, I'm pretty sure, their last meeting. Uh, their election is coming up. If you haven't, anybody out there hasn't got their ballot or put it in the box, please do so. Their election is, is going on and will be decided, I believe, next Tuesday, May, May 5th. <clears throat> so please get that done. Uh, I did slip in on the last part of the free out of fight presentation to Congresswoman Bobert, and uh, it looked to be well received. And I was impressed with the amount of people that came from afar to listen to this. So maybe we're getting out there and getting some work done. And uh, other than that, a uh, few phone calls, few messages, and I had a request from some folks that we put up signs as you come into Montezuma County that uh, have the wording on there that this is a right to farm community. Seems that some people don't think this is a right to farm community anymore. So I don't know what it would take to do that, Shaq. I don't know what kind of funds are available. But uh, if you could look into that. Is there an organization that's no, this a, was, a loose collaboration that's trying to put this together, or it who's was just It for? was a couple of folks over at the Republican uh, General Assembly that night and said that they had had some people that didn't really know what a right to farm community was. And uh, so they're asking for something in the way of billboards? I mean, just I, a, I don't want to uh, bounce the ball back to their court, but if there's Just Republican a road sign down, you know, like it says, Montezuma County is... is uh, Welcome to Montezuma County, right to farm, something like that. Yeah. Um, so I have two initial thoughts. One is There's reactive and saying if they're asking for it, then maybe the Republican Party should pay for it. However, if we added to the welcome to Montezuma County sign something endorsed by one political party, we might be asking uh, for different issues. So um, I'm happy to look into it. I'm not sure what way the commission will want to go, but I'll look into it. Okay. And that's all I have. All right. Commissioner Copenhagen. On Thursday and Friday, like I stated earlier, I attended the Club 20 watershed conference up in Grand Junction. Um, 
felt like I was representing MVIN, the county commission here up there. Um, there was lots of good information there. They at least showed that the Forest Service has come around and started doing a bunch of categorical exclusions so they could get some of these trees removed thin in this forest out. And they are making some progress and their main focus is down here in the San Juans of all the whole state. Their focus has been right here in the San Juans. So they, and I can, I can tell you on my own permit, they have, they have done some, some serious thinning on a lot of the, of the pine trees in our, our area up here. So um, they're going to continue pushing that forward and, and working up the country. They are spreading out into a couple other areas in Colorado, but the main focus is right here in the San Juans. That's where they've started and that's where they're centralizing their focus right now. So um, there was a lot of support there from different groups that have actually come around to the fact that these forests are so unhealthy because they've done nothing for the last 40 years or 50 years since all these lawsuits have been here. And they are going to do some stuff. So, and they do have some data about how much they're thinking the water shed improves with, with these thinnings and stuff. And so they, they, they do have some data they're coming out with as to what the water savings they're anticipating from these different projects. So I, I'll get some of that to you in the next week or so. I'll bring some of that data back. Um, that's the main thing I had reported other than a few phone calls and stuff. I don't know much going on. <clears throat> yeah, I do know there's some big timber sales going on up there. And a couple of local guys are worried about getting the timber down. <laughs> Roads are going to be in good shape to get them down. Well, the, the thing of it is, though, they have these timber sales and there's there is so few people that will even bid on them because the, the quality of the wood is not that great. Right. And, you know, there's no size to the timber, so they can't only can make certain things out of it. Most of it, they're just making two befores and stuff like small, that out of small real small stuff. stuff. But there's just, there's just not the people there to bid on a timber sale, mm -hmm. to sell it. They'll put, they'll put a timber sale out, what? and they won't even get a bid on it which is another issue but, uh, that we're fighting as far as workforce. People can't even bid on it because they don't have the workforce anymore. They don't have the workforce, but the, the one thing that came out up there too is, and we were trying to stress to them is, you know, most people won't bid on this because they got to go through all your red tape and jump mm -hmm. through all your yep. hoops to do this stuff. And sometimes that's worse than doing the work. Yeah. And so they were, they have actually tried to address some of that and they're trying, and they said they would keep looking into it. So we'll see how it works out. But they're trying to cut that back down and trying to do some things with those categorical exclusions so that they can get some stuff done. And they're, they're, they're doing categorical exclusions not on small areas. They're doing categorical exclusions on 500,000 acres. Oh, very not, large. Not, they're doing yeah. landscape exclusions. Yeah. That's a, that was the big thing that they that they've done is they changed that from small areas to they're actually doing landscape areas. So, I mean, it's a good thing. That, that'll make a significant difference. It'll, it'll make a significant yeah. difference in what they can get done. All right. Okay, um, <clears throat> for me, I, uh, along with Commissioner Copenhaver, we attended a uh, uh, dedication that Congresswoman Bober gave to uh, our past Commissioner Stevenson's uh, family, wife. Um, <clears throat> we were able to give the plaque that we had presented um, to the family and then a congressional flag that flew over the state capitol. Uh, that afternoon we then went into the, um, the weed management uh, program that Bonnie had given uh, for the Congresswoman. It was two hours of uh, we really got into the weeds. Pretty, inter pretty interactive and we did get out into the weeds. I did make an ask, I was the first one to get up and speak that, you know, any, any kind of funding that they have that's available, um, you know, that, that we'd be looked at. And hopefully along with what Commissioner Copenhaver said, um, you know, that they're doing in the Forest Service will, will be looked on favorably. 
um, from And there. I just want to piggyback off of that a little bit, Commissioner. The Congresswoman is looking not only to hopefully help Montezuma County, but to the start free out of fight throughout removal throughout the entire Colorado River Basin. So mm -hmm. the whole Western Slope. Um, I attended uh, CCI, CCCA, which is the Colorado County Clerks Association slash Colorado Counties Incorporated uh, Zoom meeting. Kim and I uh, started that together at uh, 10.30. And at 11, I had to leave because I had an engagement over at the Senior Center uh, with Mr. Powers to um, talk to the seniors. So. Kim, I'm gonna let you give kind of a quick synopsis of that if you don't mind. But it was basically all built around um, voter integrity and some of the issues that we're all seeing and dealing with there. I, I, like I said, I was only there for the first 30 minutes of that meeting before I had to get to another meeting here locally. So with that, I'll let you take that over, Kim. It was basically just a discussion about Senate Bill 153 and the Mesa County reports to update us on where the CCCA stands and to discuss with the CCI where they're, what they're looking at. That's basically all it was. Okay. Um, and then again, I went to the, had lunch with the senior center, um, had, a, had a great discussion. There was probably 30, I would say, Shaq, 30 people in the room. So that tells me that the senior center is, is coming back alive. I mean, they had uh, had a great meal. Uh, we had the fish. The food was, was really good. Fish Friday, and, and it was actually pretty awesome. So kudos to the staff over there. Uh, and then we were able to give them about 20 minutes of our time before we each had to run and get to another meeting uh, of, of Q&A. So it was, actually, it was actually very good. Uh, went and spent the rest of the afternoon out at the <clears throat> fairgrounds at the Ag Show, spent uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday out at the Ag Show. And like I said earlier, I, I talked to a lot of people over a lot of different things, but I can tell you right now that once you explain and educate the people, they can understand it and get it. But mostly, they really don't understand um, what, what happens in government and how monies are spent and what can be spent and what, what a budget is and you know, you don't have to spend the entire budget. It doesn't mean you even spend a budget just because it was budgeted. It doesn't mean that it ever gets spent at all. But uh, great, great time for education for those three days. Uh, came back in, we had our workshop yesterday afternoon. We went over our memorandum of <coughs> understanding with Prowers County, which we just accepted today. And then the Congresswoman um, staffer from Durango, Naomi Dodd Dobbs was in here yesterday um, giving us an update of what the Congresswoman is doing as far as um, the free out of fight program that we have existing here in Montezuma County and that we would be a leader in the whole Western Slope for what we are doing. Uh, went to the Dolores workshop last night. Uh, it was, it was kind of, kind of short. The mayor wasn't there. Um, they again, like Commissioner Lindsay said, they have, I, I believe they have one more meeting and then they'll do their transition. So those ballots are also out for uh, uh, the town of Dolores. Uh, their biggest uh, discussion last night was basically moving a resolution forward for a conservation easement that the city owns uh, of an intent to move it forward. Now that was nothing more than an intent the people coming in can then uh, accept it, deny it, and move on with it. Um, and that, I'm pretty sure, concludes my report. I have a, uh, Kim, I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, on your renewing your registrations, that opt-in for that $29, or op it's opt-out, is that correct? Opt-out. Okay, and how, how do they do that? It hasn't been fully developed yet, but there will be um, information sent to all of the registrations okay. for opting out. Great, thank you. That actually was a question that we were asked at the Senior Center, uh, which I said, I couldn't answer that. You have to go talk to the clerk, so I apologize, Kim. 
you'll probably get phone calls on that. <laughs> there are some things that we just can't answer fully uh, that other elected officials take care of. We, we are aware of the bills, but we don't really know the, the actual 100% of the components within it, so, okay. All right, having passed through. Second session. Huh? Yeah, I would so move we go into executive session for a conference with the attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on a specific legal question under CRS section 24-6-402, parentheses four, parentheses B. Second. Okay, <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded to go into executive session for a conference with the attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions under CRS section 24 doors. 24-6-402, parentheses 4, parentheses B, and included in that will be our clerk and recorder, Ms. Purcell, Commissioners Copenhaver, Candelaria, Lindsay, uh, Attorney McLaren, and um, Administrator Powers, and this will be to discuss fiber network. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Okay, gentlemen, you're live. Okay. Uh, we got to come out of executive yeah. session and then... I move we come out of executive session. Second. Okay, if we move to second in. To come out of executive session and back into our regular board meeting. And, and now with that... I move we go in to executive session for a conference with the attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal, legal questions under CRS section 24-6-402, parentheses four, parentheses B. Second. It's been moved and seconded to go into executive session for a conference with the attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions under CRS section 24-6-402, parentheses four, parentheses B, and it will be to discuss Ironwood. And included in that will be our clerk, Kim Purcell, commissioners, Copenhaver, Candelaria, and Lindsay, attorney McLaren, and administrator Powers. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Okay, gentlemen, you are live for the last time today. I move we come out of executive session. Second. <laughs> they moved and seconded that we um, exit executive session and go back into our regular board meeting. And with that, gentlemen, we have come to the end of our um, agenda. So I would entertain motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn this March 29th meeting, 2022. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.